So how many have read the book of Genesis? Raise your hand if you've read the book of Genesis. I've read part of it. Okay, you've read part of it? Okay. So sometimes it's good to read the Bible. I've been reading through the Bible, through parts of the Bible, and um, reading the Bible actually chronologically. Like, in other words, like from the events that happen in the Bible, because the, the order of the Bible, you know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, it's not, exa- it's, it's not in the order that the events happened. You know, like you have like Genesis 1 through 11, and then you have Job. So there's the book of Job, which is an old book, which it's interesting because there's no mention of Israel in the book of Job. There's no mention of uh, Moses or the commandments or any of these things there. It's just that Job uh, knew God, and he, you know, and so there was this conversation with Job and his friends, and there was a conversation with God and Satan that was there. And if we read through that, so it's what I'm doing, and it's interesting because Genesis, it's a book of beginnings. It's a book of beginnings. It's the, uh, the beginning of the world, the, um, the, be- the first man, the first sin is is in the book of Genesis. And then we have the story of Abraham, which begins, I think, chapter 12, right? starts with Abraham, or Abram. It starts out because God changed his name to Abraham, but Abram, which means, uh, which means exalted father. But, Ab- but Abram was not a father yet. Very interesting to think about that, because God calls things that aren't as though they are. He looks at us as though we are seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. And that's our place. That's our position with him. But yet, although we're seated in this chair, but we are seated. We are, our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. We, are, we, are, we have been glorified, the Bible says, but we're not in heaven yet. It's pretty amazing when you think about that. In the mind of God, he sees the finished work. The finished work when Jesus was on the cross. The last words he said, it is finished in John 19.30. There was nothing else to do. So the work is finished. And so if we read about Abraham here, because in Genesis chapter 15, there was this covenant that God made with, with Abraham. And there was, it was an everlasting covenant. It was a covenant based upon the promises of God. It wasn't based upon Abraham's faithfulness. It was based upon the fact that God was faithful. Not, not Abraham's faithfulness, but that God himself was faithful. And this is interesting here because if we read it here in Genesis chapter 15, in verse 1, it says, After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield in thy exceeding great reward. I just remember the first time I ever read that, I was like, whoa. Like, the reward is God himself, the reward. And then it says here, and this is interesting because we like to pull, we like to pick apart the Bible, right? It's called exegesis. We like to dig into the original. We're not going to get too deep into it, but we're going to think about some of the phrases here. It says, and after, it says, after these things, after these things, what things? That things that happened previously, there was warfare that had happened with Abraham or with, uh, with Abram here. Because this is before his name was changed to Abraham. There was some wars that had happened with kings and other things. And it's interesting here because this word for things and the word for the word are the same word. The word is dekar in the Hebrew. Dekar, it means word or thing or... It's interesting here. So, like, you can maybe say, like, after these words or after these this thing that had happened in other words what it was the word of fear that abraham could have had fear because of all of the things that had happened to him previously he could have had fear but what happened the word of the lord came unto abram the word of the lord and he's and, and god says that and what does god say with what does the word of the lord say it says fear not fear not fear not abram for i am thy shield and what does the Bible tell us? That to put up, to put up the shield of faith in Hebrews 6.16. 6, the shield of faith. The Bible tells us that, that, that truth is our shield and, and, and our buckler in Psalm 91.4. 
our truth, the truth of the Bible. And I had to look up the word buckler. Like, what does that mean, buckler? And it means something that surrounds you, like a wall or like a fortress. It's kind of like, well, like a shield, you have to get behind a shield, right? And the Bible says we put up the shield of faith that we may extinguish the fiery darts of the wicked one. Because the devil is a real person, and there are demons, and they throw fiery darts they, to put it to plant into your mind. And if we turn our ears away from the truth, guess what? We will be turned into fables and doctrines of demons. It doesn't matter who we are in this world. That's why, what, faith, it comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God in Hebrews 10, 17. That's why we need to hear it continuously. That's why we meditate on the word day and night in Psalm chapter 1. And we, we abstain from evil, but we, we meditate on the word. What, day and night? That's a little excessive, isn't it? Day and night, I mean, got other things to think about, right? Other things to meditate on. But we see all things because if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. All the old things have passed away. And how many things have become new? All. All, all things. All things. That's like, you know, it's like, what, what is it? It's like, that, that it, was, that it says, after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram. After these things, it was, there was a new word. There was a new truth that Abraham could grab a hold of the truth of God. And what does he say here? That I am your shield in thy exceeding great reward. It was God himself. And we know that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, Jesus. He was Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. That the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And that we have what? It's the reward. It, the, re the word reward here, it's interesting here because it's, it means... Um, let me make sure I get this straight here. The word reward, did I not? Yeah, the word is sekar here. And it means the payment of a contract. The payment of a contract. The, the root word means to purchase. The root of it, to purchase. And we can say here that what Abraham looked, though, and God told him that God's, that his possession, that God's possession that his possession was God. It wasn't that we know that the reward, he didn't work for the reward, right? Because of what the Bible says in Hebrews eleven six that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And what was the reward? That you find God. Amen. Our great and exceeding reward. It's by faith. If any man comes to God, he must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of those who, what, diligently seek him. Like the faith of Abraham. God is not a respecter of persons. It's like, well, Abraham was some great man. You know, it's an interesting thing about Abraham. I was studying about Abraham. And every time that God commanded Abraham to do something, Abraham immediately obeyed. God told him to get up out of his country and go into a land that God would show him. He obeyed immediately. God told him to sacrifice Isaac on, on the altar. He rose up early in the morning took Isaac, he was going to sacrifice him on the altar immediately. But his nephew Lot was a little different than that, wasn't he? His nephew Lot, like the, the angels come, if you, if, if you read the book of Genesis, that the angels came to Sodom, where Lot was at, and they went to there to save Lot, because there wasn't even ten righteous men there. Because remember, Abraham prayed, you know, like very respectfully to God, right? If there's 50 righteous men, will you spare it? And it, yes, I'll spare it for 50. If there is, what, he went down to 45, to 30, to 20, to all the way down to 10. He should have kept on going. Is there one? If there was one, if he would have went to one, would God have answered his prayer? I think so. Yeah, I think so. But it says that the angels came there, and, they, and that Lot was there, and they said, let's get out of here right now. And it says Lot lingered. He's like, yeah, yeah, whatever. He had to grab him and take him out of there. But Abraham wasn't like that. Abraham immediately obeyed God. I mean, what if we become like that too? We immediately obey God. We hear the word of God and we respond to truth. Faith obedience. I mean, that is a great thing to grab a hold of. Faith obedience. And it says here that after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision... In other words, what, was that, what does that mean? Like, I don't know. Maybe not a dream. Maybe it was night because he said, look at the stars. If you can count them. Perhaps if you can count the grains of sand. 
If we, re we go on to read the story here. Maybe it was in a trance, but somehow, but he didn't physically see God. We know that. Because the Bible tells us that no man has seen God at any time. But the only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. In John 1.18. And what's that word for declared? <laughs> exegeomai. It means to bring out the full meaning. That's where we get the word exegesis. To bring out the full meaning. We don't, we've ne we don't know God. But God became a man. And now we can know him. And he is our exceeding great reward. God. And, the, and, and Jesus, who is God with us, Emmanuel, gives to us the gift of the Holy Spirit, who is God in us. It's even greater. And then we have the evidence, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Colossians 1.27. Christ in you. In other words, like what, what the, that, that's his love, his life, that we, have, we, we live by the faith of the Son of God in Galatians 2.20. He's given us this as a gift. He's given us the Holy Spirit that we can know even the deep things of God. Because, and it says here, and, and, so, and so what was the covenant here? The Abrahamic covenant. That, that, that number one, there would be a seed that would come through Abraham's, that would come from Abraham. And we know that the seed is Christ. It says in Galatians 3, that the seed is Christ. And then what was number two? There was the promised land. There was two things. There was the promised land. That they would go into the promised land and, they, and that what? It was a land flowing with milk and honey. And so we, that, that we have the son, that he's given to us the son. And now we're able to go into, because now we have the Holy Spirit, we're able to go into the world of God, into the promised land, out of our own world. We like, we, that's the way I thought before I got saved. I just didn't think about anything else but myself. It was, it was just my own little world that I lived in, and I was, I was occupied with my own things that I was doing, and I had my plans that I was doing. I was going to do this and that and the other thing, but yet then we get saved, and then we end up getting into the world of God, which is much more beyond my own world, much beyond it, and it's like the promised land, and what was in the promised land? There were enemies, wasn't there? There was a lot of enemies there. Maybe the enemies that they wouldn't exist if they didn't go into the promised land. They would have never have dealt with those enemies had they not gone into there. It even lists all of, all of them in here, in 15, at the end. It lists, the, it lists all of their enemies, and they were to drive them out. And you know what? Not all at once, right? A little bit at a time. A little bit at a time. And that's what happens when we get saved. We enter into warfare, don't we? There's a warfare that never used to exist there before, a warfare between the flesh and the spirit. It was a warfare that, had, that never existed before because all I had was the flesh. I didn't have the spirit. And the spirit is against the flesh, and the flesh is against the spirit. The two are contrary one to another. There's a warfare. The demons, all of a sudden, they're not too happy about that, that you got saved. They want to stop everything about you to, to keep you from hearing the word of God. Just keep them away from the word of God. Because the word of the Lord came unto, came unto Came unto Abram. It was the word of faith. It was the perfect love that cast out fear in 1 John 4 18. It's like we don't, we never experienced that before. It was it was the word that came from God. The Logos. Like in the in the New Testament, the Jesus, the Logos, it is like the complete word here. And it says that that I that fear not, Abram, because why? Because he was his strength, his shield, his exceeding great reward. That's why the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 6 to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Wow. He is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. I mean, we should talk about spiritual warfare more often because the Bible says to be, to be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion seeking about whom he may devour. Mm -hmm. Is it First Peter five ten? He it is, and he and what it, it's like in what in, if you read the book of Job, it says God approached Satan and said, "Where have you been at?" Of course, God knows where he's been, right? <laughs> he says, "I've been running to and fro upon the earth." 
up and down, the running the length of it, the breadth of it. That's what the devil does. He runs around all over the earth, seeking, he's a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And, and that's why we're to give no place to the devil. We're not ignorant of Satan's devices, his naoma, his mind. It's like we know the way he thinks. He's the same old serpent from the very beginning whenever he deceived Eve in the garden. He's a liar. He makes God out to be a liar, wants to turn the truth of God into a lie. That's what he does. He throws fiery darts. He, he, he gets us to try to think things that what are not true. It's not true. It's a lie. It's what the devil does. That's why they, we're to grab a hole. We're to cleave onto truth. It sets us free. In John 8, 32, it sets us free, the truth. It is our shield. As we said in Psalm 91, 4. Amazing verses there. And if we go on to, we go on to read here, Abram, in verse 2, it says, And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eliezer, El El Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born of my house is mine heir. And in verse 4 it says, Behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thy own bowels shall be thy heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. Do you know that with all of modern technology today, they've tried to number the stars? We're very highly technological. You know, and it says in the book of Daniel, I don't know if you ever read this before, I think it's at Daniel chapter 9, it says that in the latter days men shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. It's like, wow. they like, what do you mean? I think Daniel looked into the future and he looked at, um, he looked at Interstate 75, right? Or Interstate 275. They're, they're, like, and men are running, they're rushing back and forth. There's airplanes flying through the air. It's like, whoa. It's like, where's everybody going? Like, they're going two different directions. Where's it? Like, they're going that way and they're going that way. Men are running to and fro, you know? It's like, and, and, and then knowledge shall be increased. And I tell you, right now, knowledge is exp exponentially uh, doubling every 18 months. Like, knowledge of computer that, that is, like, mind-boggling when you think about that. Think of, like, the way technology was, like, 20 years ago. Way different. It is, it is exponentially advancing. And you know what else is also exponentially advancing? Evil in the world. Mm -hmm. Evil. Along with it, because there's more opportunities to do evil now than there ever was before. It's like, wow, because of technology. Of course, we can use it also for, for God, for the things of God. It's amazing now that I can like search something on the internet in, in, in the Bible and all this other stuff pops up. Wow, I didn't see that verse, I didn't see that verse. It's like, wow, that's cool that's on there. It's amazing when we think about that. And, in what, and what did Jesus say? That, that so as in the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Well, what was the note that we just look at? We just read it. Genesis, what, chapter 6, right? That there, was, there was great evil in the world. And it says that the, the imagination of, of every man's heart was always evil continuously. They weren't meditating on the word day and night. They were meditating on the, the, the other things that were not of God day and night. The imagination of their heart was only evil continuously. It's like, wow. That's what's going on today. It's a godless world that we live in. That's why the Bible tells us to gather all together. All the more is what? You see the day approaching. Hebrews 10, 25. That day is approaching, the day of the rapture. And let no one tell you that there's no rapture. And it is not a pre-tribulational rapture. There is. It is a pre-tribulational rapture. Because there's a group of people out there today that, that want to say it's not. It's the only reason why I say it, because there's lies out there once again. It's like, why? And why even bring it up? To cause division? You know? It's like, why do we make a big deal? There's people on the internet, on Facebook, people you know, <laughs> that are on there, that, that, want, that want to say, well, there's, why, why bring it up? There's a lot of things that we might be wrong about, actually, quite possibly, you know? But like, why cause divisions? Like, we believe in that. 
And we hope in that. And the Bible says to comfort one another with this, with these thoughts, that we're going to be harpazo, snatched off, off of this planet. It's like, wow, you're going to be sitting there and your shoes are going to be sitting there smoking. You're going to be up in heaven. It's like, wow, snatched away. And you know what? Every, every prophecy has been fulfilled for his return. I just believe he's waiting for the fullness of the Gentiles to come in. That's what it says, until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. Because we went evangelizing this Friday at these apartments right down the street this way. I'm getting my directions mixed up. Felix was getting mixed up, so I got mixed up too. It's like, which, which way are we going here? Right? But it was down there. It was another apartment complex down this way. You know, you could be leading somebody to the Lord, and, and God was like, that's the fullness of the Gentiles. Right then and there. He's not going to waste another second. He knows the day or the hour when it's going to be, but no man does. That's why we don't predict, we don't make predictions as many people have done for over through the centuries, but there has not been a single one. We're still here. <laughs> We're still here in this world. Jesus sent us out into the world. It's a great commission to evangelize. You know what? It's part of the armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6. The feet shod with the gospel. It's like, wow. What do you put on your feet? The gospel. Not shoes, the gospel. Feet shod with the gospel. In other words, you're walking. You're going to tell somebody about Jesus, about the truth. It's like, wow. And it's interesting about Abraham because if you go back to Genesis chapter 12, it talks about Abraham being blessed by God and becoming a blessing because he was blessed by God. It's like, wow. I mean, the devil wears out the saints of the Most High God. That's his ministry. Wear you down. So you lose your motivation, lose your drive, lose your love. Lose your motivation for God. It's like, wow. Especially attack against the pastor. Like if you can break the, take the pastor out, they'll take the whole church out. You know, so pray for me. I need your prayers. It's like we pray. We pray for one another because we love one another and build one another up. And this is interesting here. So let's, let's read on some more. Where were we at? It says, verse 5, And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto them, So shall thy seed be. Verse 6, And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it unto him, for righteousness. It doesn't say he believed the Lord. It says he believed in the Lord. And he believed, oh, in the Lord. In the Lord. I'm glad yours doesn't say that. It says he believed in the Lord. He believed in the Lord. Not just believe, you know, like, what does it mean, believe in the Lord? It's like, you know, believe that he's real? No, it's, it goes beyond that, doesn't it? He's trusting him as your Savior, which everyone in this room has done. Trusting Him, you believe in Him, you accept Him. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We call upon Him. We ask Him to save us. It's like, but if you're saved, but you're sealed with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. In Ephesians 1.13, it says he believed it was, he was charged to his account for righteousness. Not because he did righteous things, because the Bible says in, in Romans 4.2 that if Abraham were justified by works... He would have something to boast about, but not before God. If Abraham were justified by works, he's not justified by works. Because it says, what does the scripture say? That Abraham believed in the Lord, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. In Romans 4, 5. Or Romans 4, 3. He counted unto him for righteousness. And so it says that... <clears throat> and then... Um, verse 7. And it says, And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of the Ur of the Chaldeans to give thee this land to inherit it. Wow. He brought him out of the place that he was at with his family, with, with, with the people that, he, the, the old things that, that he was used to. And what, and what he, the, the Bible says that Abraham immediately obeyed. To go into this land, he told Abraham, can you walk up and down the length and the breadth of this? I've given us all to you for your possession. All of it, this land. 
And we have all things of God. We have been given all of this, this, this land, the, 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 the things of God to inherit for our possession. And it's interesting because we are God's possession, because the Bible says that we are his purchased possession. And to feed the, the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood in Acts 20, 28. And the Lord knows those who are his, that we are, God looks at us and that we are his possession. And we are, we are his workmanship in Ephesians 2.10, created unto good works, which he has purchased, which he, which he has foreordained that we should walk in them. Because we've been bought with a price. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, bought with a price. It's like, wow, you're not your own. We are not our own. We've been bought with a price. So we, we, we believe this. We look at this like my life is not my own. We were been bought with a price. It's like, wow. So glor we glorify God within our body and in our spirit, which are God's. It goes on to say. And then um, in verse 8, it says, And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said unto him, Take a heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he said unto him, All these... And he took unto him all these and divided them in the midst and laid each piece one against another. But the birds divided he not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. I just always thought that was an interesting verse there, right? Like Abraham was making sacrifices and God told him to do this. But yet the birds were going to come and land down on it and they, they could have like pecked at it or whatever. And then Abraham's like, get out of here. Like, you know... Like it rains on the just and the, and the unjust. It's like we, we you know, it's, I, I just think it's an interesting verse that it's just written there in the Bible like that. Abraham drove them away because he was, he was doing something. But, yet, you know, just, just like you and me. In other words, he wasn't any different than you or me. You know, we, 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 we do things too. And we, we, we and then, you know, and we, you know, things come, but we drive them away. It's like we have music that's playing. It's like, so... I write the manager an email, goes away. You know, we just, you know what I mean? I don't know. I don't know what else to say about it in there. But anyway, but it says, and then in verse 12, and when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he, he said unto Abram, know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them 400 years. In other words, God was showing Abram the future. He was a prophet. A prophet in the sense that he would know future events that, had, that was going to happen with his seed, that God was going to actually reveal all these things to him. Um, and it says here, and then it says that, Verse 14, and also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterwards they shall come out with great substance. This is very interesting here to think about this because it was, it was like God was showing Abraham that they were going to be slaves in Egypt for, and it says in Exodus, 430 years. It says here 400 years. It's just a round number is all. It's not a, a mistranslation uh, in the Bible. It's just 400 years is a round number. But it says here that God knew that they were going to do that. And it's interesting because God did this with a nation, that they were going to be slaves in Egypt for 400 years. But he also did it with an individual, with Job. That Job was tested. His faith was tested. God took away his health, took away his family, took away his wealth, took away all these things, and then he was given a double portion there. And it says in, in Job chapter 42, verse 8, it says that when God told uh, Job's friends, his three friends, to go and bring the sacrifices to Job, and Job would pray for them. And then it says, and then God gave Job the double portion when he prayed. Whenever Job took his mind off of himself and started thinking about other people. Very interesting, isn't it? It's like he took his mind off his own situation and he started thinking about others. And Job was like, like a high priest, like a type of Christ. 
there he would pray for his friends. They would bring him the sacrifices and he would pray for them. Um, and same thing with a nation here. That God would raise up a man, Moses, and deliver them from slavery, from Egypt. And they came out with what? They gave them all the gold. They gave them all, all of their substance so that they could worship God in the wilderness with it. Amazing to think about it. Um, and it says, And also that nation, whom they shall serve, okay, and in verse 15, And thou shalt go unto thy fathers in peace, and shall be buried in a good old age. And if we read the, the end of Genesis here, why Abraham lived to be, what, 165 years old, which was the patriarchs in those days, they, they lived to be that, that, that old. Maybe because of the genetical pool that had happened, because men lived to be 800, 900 years old. Methuselah lived, what, 965 years, something like that. I'm not sure of the exact number the oldest man, but then they progressively started living shorter and shorter lives after the flood. Interesting. And then it says here um, in verse 16, but in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again in the iniquity of the Amorites, because the, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. In other words, the four, fourth generation with every generation being 100 years, because it was 400 years. Um, and then it says, let's finish up here in verse 17. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. And notice that it was God that did it. God passed between the pieces. Abraham didn't have to do anything. That meant that the covenant was a covenant of promise and that God was going to fulfill his promise. And it wasn't based upon Abraham, it was based upon the promises of God. Because all the promises of God are yea and amen. It was God that passed between the two pieces. There, there was, there was the covenant, there was between Abraham and God. And God was the one who sealed the covenant between them. Sealed it. And then it says... In the same day, in verse 18, the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. The Canaanites, or the Canaanites, the Kenizzites, and the Cadmonites, and the Hittites, and the Perizzites, and a bunch of other Zites <laughs> that are in here, the Canaanites, and all of them that were in there, all of the enemies of the land, that he, that he gave them for the possession, that they would be driven out from the land. And it says here that um, we know that if you look on a map here, do you ever like look on Bible maps? Did you have like a map in your Bible? Do you ever do that when you read these things in here? Good. What's that? I said, I'm just trying. Yeah, we look, I think it's very interesting. You look, if you have, if you have a study Bible that has maps in it, you can look and see where that the great river Euphrates was way up north of present-day Israel, and then the river of Egypt is what, it's in Egypt. It's, the land was much bigger. And, of course, they've never possessed all that land before. But it, it was the promise of God. They've never possessed all that. There you go. You got one yeah, right there. Mis- it's really cool. It has a missionary journey of Paul. And the spread oh, of yeah. Christian so check it out. And so there, there was... There was between this big land mass that was there that was promised, and it will be during the millennial reign that Israel will be there and Jesus will be the king of the world. Because they, if you look at also Israel, it's very interesting, like where that's at, and it, all, it almost is like it's in the center of the world right there. If you look at it on a map, because the way how the geography is and everything, it's almost like right in the middle of the world right there. It's just, I don't know, it's just something I noticed. Right there, where the geography is. Because why? Because Jesus, when he returns, he will set up his millennial kingdom after the the thousand or after the tribulation period, the seven year tribulation period, and there will be the thousand year reign of Christ on the earth. That that's where he will be king, and it will be there will be peace on earth and goodwill toward men. At that time, it's amazing when we think about that. So, Amen. 
All right, so let's pray. So, Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this truth in the Bible. We thank you for looking at the Bible spiritually. We just want to give everyone an opportunity, if you've never received Christ today, to accept him today as your Savior, accept the gift of eternal life. You can accept him right now, right where you are. Don't hesitate like Lot did and lingered, but like how Abraham obeyed God immediately, that that you believe what God has said. Just accept him today as your Savior. Just say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. I'm not good enough to go to heaven, but you died in my place. You paid the penalty of all my sins. I accept you today as my Savior. I accept the free gift of eternal life. And if you've said that prayer, if you accepted the gift of eternal life from Jesus today, then give me a call, 727-452-7445. 727-452-7445. And if I don't answer... Leave a voicemail, and I will definitely call you back. So, amen? Amen. amen. All right, yes, Danielle. Um, we said when Job prayed, God doubled what? God doubled his offering? Well, he doubled all of his, everything that he had lost. Oh, okay. His family, his cattle. If you read the beginning of Job, okay. I mean, read Job sometime. Yeah, yeah, read Job. I mean, you know, read Job, you know, whatever. Yeah. I can I can give you a link where you can do it if you want to. It's it's a it's a website. It just kind of gives you an idea and you know just like three chapters a day. And if you do it every day, then you'll read the whole Bible in a year. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. So I'll send you the link. Yeah. Okay. If anybody else wants the link, I can send it to you as well. If you want to read the Bible chronologically. It's just, I, I just like, I don't know, you, you can either read it from cover to cover, whichever way, but, you know, uh, but I've, I've been reading it chron- chronologically, yeah. Yeah, because it's kind of cool, because when you get into, like, Samuel, like, First Samuel, then you'd be reading the Psalms, too, because that's when the Psalms were written, was when Samuel, the events of Samuel were going on. When David was there, David wrote it, you know, and then Moses wrote Psalm 90, and, and you know, so it's just, it's just very interesting. You learn a lot of things like that way. I, I mean, I do. Anyway, I'll send you the link. I'll send you the link. If anybody else wants it, um, I'll send it to you as well. So, yeah, so that's really good. But anyway, did I answer your question or no? Yeah. Okay. Like, oh, yeah, he doubled all his possessions. So yeah, if you read in Job, if you read Job, it lists what he owned, and then it, then it lists what he owned again afterwards. Like, you know, he, his wealth, his um, health, so his family, everything got doubled. I don't know how his health got doubled, but anyway. No, his children were yeah. replaced. They weren't doubled. Right. But he had twice as many. Right. He had twice as many. Yeah. So, but yeah, they weren't the same children. They were different. They were different. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, with the two dates... 400 years of oppression yeah. in Egypt and 450 or 30. 430 in Exodus, yeah. <clears throat> that was because after, when they went in, on, they were in under the headship of Joseph. So they okay. weren't oppressed when they first got there. Uh-huh. And then the, di- the Egyptian dynasty changed and then they were okay. oppressed. That makes sense. So they weren't they weren't slaves at first. Right, right. When the new dynasty came in, then they were made slaves. Then they became slaves because Joseph's family was there, so that makes sense. Right. Yeah, okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that's good. I kept that today, so I don't know. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Um, Pastor Rob, you, you in your message you mentioned that uh, <clears throat> You were speaking about man should increase in knowledge. Which, yeah. Which is 
something that it is, it, it is true. It is happening, you know. Uh, big time. Big time, yeah. And also, uh, the evil is exponentially increasing. So, you also mentioned, you know, uh, the internet, Facebook, and stuff like that. And, right. And, and I see the, like, the internet, which is a, it, it's a parallel between good and evil. Because there's a lot of things that mm -hmm. are there that are for the good of the people. You, know, thank you can God. use it for good. Exactly. Thank God for the internet that you know, messages can reach countries at a certain right. time that preachers can't be there. But at the same time, the enemy uses it to do the opposite of right. the good. It's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. It's yeah. Very, it's very it is very interesting. But yeah, because like I remember like back in the 90s, we didn't have Facebook, Internet. That wasn't that long ago. You know what I mean? That wasn't, I guess we had, was there Internet? I guess there was Internet, but we didn't use it though. I couldn't have my pager in school. Yeah, we didn't, yeah. Have phones. They're like, oh. Yeah, right. And that wasn't even that long ago. So we just had, like our Sunday morning service was not on Facebook. Bible studies were not on Facebook. But we did have radio. Radio was really good, actually, because a lot of people, they heard about you through radio. They heard about your ministry yeah. through the radio. But now we don't have that anymore. Now we have Internet. Yeah, radio was reaching a lot of people that were uh, seeking the Lord or something good for their life. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, the Internet today, it's just, it's an influential tool that... Even if it can even let us straight people who are seeking mm -hmm. the Lord, because there are people there teaching false doctrine. Right. That's true. They are teaching false. Doctrine. Yeah. You know? There is that, but there's a lot of I I find out that a lot of people have. Seems like a lot of it. There's a lot of good things that you know if you're worth searching that you can find on it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Like absolutely. commentaries and stuff like that. A lot of it's good, but some of it, you know. You also have like the you know Jehovah's Witnesses are on there, Seventh Day Adventist, uh, you know um, uh, they're, they're on there too with their what they believe, you know. But I just I of course I I just careful about what I look at and just go there. So I know not to you know. Yeah. Well, and, and we're careful because we know the doctrine of. Ephesians chapter 6, you know, where we're putting on the armor of God. Yeah. You know, uh, to, you know, deflect those uh, fiery darts that can be coming in one's direction. Uh, you know, I mean, but there's also a lot of people that are not prepared like that. And they take for face value what they're, what they're listening to or seeing. And, I mean, yeah. Right, yeah, they believe it. They you know, believe it. they can believe they believe anything. And you know, yeah. there's a lot of different voices out there. Yes, there are. There's a lot of different things that people say. <laughs> and that's why, you know, you like our every our speech always has to be with grace seasoned with salt. It has to be that I mean, our our, our, our if we err, we need to err on the side of grace. You know, if you know, but how can you? Like God loves us. Yeah. God paid right. for all of our sins. What's wrong with that? That you're going to heaven, it's a gift. I mean, you could never go wrong with saying those things because those are absolute truths. Mm -hmm. So we just, that's why we cling to that. That's why we make grace our emphasis, you know, to finish work our emphasis. And then, then we are able to rightly divide the word of truth, mm -hmm. right? We're able to, we're not carried about by every wind of doctrine in Ephesians 4.14. So, you know, it's important to be taught, to be students, yes. to go back to be noble-minded Bereans of the Bible, go back and see, search these things and see if they be so. You know, Acts seventeen eleven. You know, that's why they were noble, noble-minded. They went back to search the scriptures. They didn't just believe you're Paul the apostle. I'm just going to believe you. You're going to write the Bible too. It's like, no, I'm going to believe God. I'm going to go back and search the scriptures and see if these things be so. Well, you're Paul the apostle. You should believe everything you say. No, no one's going to go, okay, I, I, it's probably right what you're saying, but I'm going to make sure you're right. Go back and search the scriptures to, search the, to see if these things be so. That's a noble-minded Berean. Yeah. Because if you just take face for value because you trust somebody because that's like because of who they are or whatever, 
It's like, yeah, we can love our pastor, but it's like, but it could be wrong. He's a human. You know? It's like, Paul said he had sin. It's like, oh, oh okay. Well, he's teaching us the Word of God. It's like, oh, that's great. But I'm going to go back. I'm going to make sure myself. I want to see myself. Just like the woman at the well, right? She went and she was an evangelist like after she gets saved and then the people that were there, we want to go see Jesus ourselves to make sure that what you're saying is right. But we believe you, but I want to see Jesus though. I want to make sure, I want to see him myself. Then I believe when God reveals the truth to us. It's like, yeah. It's like, yeah, we have the Holy Spirit in us. We have a teacher, a man, but the Holy Spirit is our teacher. Amen. That's good stuff, isn't it? So we don't put our trust in the arm of a man, but we put it. I we put our trust in God. Yes, because you know I, I'm a human. I mean, I'll just be honest with you. Paul was candid about it, <laughs> about him being a human. So I should be too, probably. Right? Use him as an example. So I, I'm a human. I I could be wrong. I have an old sin nature. You know, it's like I, I could, you know, and, and it's, you know, that's why we go back, and then that way we're all on the same page with the same faith, believe the same thing. So I go back, oh, he's, Pastor Chuck is right. It says it right here. Amen. Even it's Jesus like, Christ said, search the scriptures, for they speak of me. Yes, he that's says, good, yeah. The yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's God himself saying, Right, that's a good point. I didn't think of that. You're listening to me, but Jesus himself, himself, the Word himself, yes. saying, go and search the Scriptures. You couldn't get a better example than that. Yeah. Right? That was to show that what they were trying to disprove was prove them wrong about him. Right, right. <laughs> he said, but if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for Moses spoke of me. It's like, wow. You search the Scriptures because you think that you have eternal life in them. But they're the ones who testify of me. It's like, wow. It's like... <laughs> yeah. yeah, and when we learn of him, he says in the scriptures that when we learn of him, we learn to recognize his voice. Mm. And that by that, by that we know yeah. where his sheep And my sheep hear my voice. My voice. Yeah. yeah. And another voice they will not, they hear. Will not hear. Yeah, that's really good. No, and they will not follow. Or another they will not follow because they know the voice of God. Yeah, so that's... Yep, yeah. yeah, that's very good. It's good stuff. Yes, it is. Yep. It's always good stuff. Mm. It's good stuff. Yeah. It's a good thoughts. Very good thoughts. Mm. Good, good uh, feedback here. Yeah, I'm yeah. very, very yeah. blessed to be here. And yes. what's interesting about Abraham believing in God because he was having a personal relationship with him. And he wasn't listening to any other voices except mm -hmm. God's alone. Right. Because you know. it says that, that after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abraham. Isn't that interesting that these, the word things and the word word are the same word? Descartes. <clears throat> what, after this word, after these things, that what, the word of fear, but Abraham, Abraham, or Abram there, he, what, he listened to the voice of God. No, no. Instead of the other voices. Like, you know, it's like, wow, he believed God instead of the other word. Because he could have looked at the situation. You know, it says he staggered not at the promises of God in unbelief, but was strong in faith. In Romans 4, it was all about Abraham, Romans chapter 4, which we went through in our class. It's like, wow. It's good. And I'm glad we have Abraham because, as an example, and not just Jesus only, because Jesus didn't have an old sin nature, but Abraham did. And he believed God. And his sins are listed there, you know, in the Bible. Where he lied two times about that his wife being his sister. Of course, she actually was his sister. It was, it was his father's uh, daughter, it says there. So he was telling, and every time that, the, there was two times that, that happened that the, the kings were there. Well, take all this money and all this cattle and everything and get out of here. So his wealth would increase. Every time, every time that, that he lied about his sister, that they would say, get out, get away. I don't, I don't want God to curse me. You know, it was like a covenant he was making with him and Abraham, the king, the kings. It was like, that was like the covenant. Here, take all this stuff and get, get you know, 
you know, don't bother me. That's an investment strategy. Yeah, that's an investment strategy. That's how he made, he got he got wealthy. But when I was well, I was reading though when the king of Sodom came though, like he didn't take his money. Right. It's interesting because the king of Sodom was like, well, I'll take the people, which is interesting, because you know what they were about. They were about like sex slavery and all this wickedness and stuff that was going on. We'll take the people and you take all the all the wealth. And Abraham says, I'm not even going to take a, a shoe latchet from you because I don't want you to ever say that I made Abraham rich. Mm. You know, it's like, wow. He said, well, only just what the, what the men have eaten. It's interesting what you pick up. Like, like I pick up a lot of things like reading and I write it down. Like, this is a good verse. This is a good verse. You know, it's like loaded. The Bible is loaded. It is like loaded. You know, and if we draw near, if we like become students, like we begin to grow like exponentially. That's what will happen to us. It's like, wow, we hear the word of God and we become students. We begin to grow. And then we have a maturity in the church. That's great. I like the fact that it says that the word of the Lord came saying. Yeah. It didn't say that he read something. You're right. So the, it's a picture of Jesus Christ coming to him in, in a personal, in yeah. A personal way. Yeah, because Melchizedek was, if you read just before that, Melchizedek came there. It was after he had been to warfare. Melchizedek, who is what, maybe a, a, a theophany of Christ, and then he gave a tithe to, of all his wealth that he had to Melchizedek, a tenth to Melchizedek. The high priest. It's very interesting. Because he had great wealth. So. I, I never knew, and I have read the book of Genesis, uh, but I didn't know that or understood that the king of Sodom wanted the people and not the money. Yeah. Which is like, um, mm -hmm. you know, Satan doesn't want the money. Satan wants to give people or anyone who goes in that direction wealth in return to take their their soul and their spirit away from God you know? yeah right and, uh, it's very interesting it was yeah. just interesting and, and, and Abraham said no yeah but, but the other kings he said yes whenever they you know it was like well he didn't have to do anything they just gave it to him because of his wife but the angels came to Abraham and, and in that was Jesus there too came to Abraham to, uh, to... Amen. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> they, they came to, to get the people out of Sodom. Yeah. You know, it's interesting that they came and it's like, okay, you know, we're going to go and get the yeah. people that are righteous out of Sodom. And, right. Uh, and it was right. Like, you know, there was none righteous. There was, and there was no, not righteous. There was one. Right. right. You can say no, not one, but there was one. Right. Lot was. The, the angels were not about about uh, um, uh, rewards. They were not about uh, um, what am I trying to say here? Uh, wealth. They were mm -hmm. about the souls. Yeah. The people that were. Right, they were more, they, they, they wanted that more. They wanted that more. And it's very interesting, because I was also reading that part where Lot was in Sodom, and it says that, that the men came to the house where the angels came, and they said, give us the men. They were going to beat the door down. Mm -hmm. They said, give us the men, and then Lot's like, take my virgin daughters instead. It's like, yeah. okay, you know, it's like, what, like, what are you thinking? You know, and then they said, no, we want the men. It's like, whoa. And then God struck them with blindness, and they were still looking for the door. Like, and I believe it. It's like they were blinded, and they were still trying to find the men after they were blinded. You'd be like, oh, God, you know, it's like, out of their mind. yeah, it would have been like, wow. It's like, shh. it's like, I mean, it's just crazy, you know? That's, yeah. That's the lustful mind. You're right. Even in their blindness, they can still continue to reach out for yeah, right. the ungodly thing. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then Lot also said to his sons-in-laws, because they were married to some other daughters, he said, we got to get out of here. And they looked at 
Lot as though one, one who was mocking, it says. Like they didn't believe him. It's like, yeah. Because he had to go to the sons-in-laws because they were, you know, the head of the household, I guess, of their wife. But it's interesting because Lot and his family could have been saved with him, like Noah and his family. God say, well, not Lot and his family, but just as only his two daughters. So I could be like Arsenio Hall, right? God saved Noah. God saved Lot. You ever seen that movie? Yeah. It's, Ars- <laughs> it's hilarious anyway. Yeah. It's not a Christian movie, but it is funny. <laughs> What's that one that, that I, I, I was listening to the radio and I caught the end of it, but there's a new Christian movie out. Oh, yeah. Jesus. What, is, the, what is it called? What is it called? The Jesus Revolution. The Jesus, you know, we should go see it sometime. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be fine. We should go see it. But, yeah, where? Calvary Chapel and Chuck Smith and all that. Okay, yeah. It's in the movies, right? Yeah. To the yeah, theater. It's supposed to be happening now. Yeah, we should go. Some people in Baltimore had seen I think we should go. Make a, a church outing okay. of it. Well, Sounds well, good. So, we are playing it out. Talking about that movie... Already on the internet, there is controversies about that. Movie. Of course, <laughs> controversies about everything. Yeah. So, yeah, from others that I, they call themselves Christians and asking people to support their channels. So, yeah, I was like, "Are you kidding me?" I mean, it just hey, you know. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Not surprising at all. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, good, uh, good time, good rap. To, to the unpure, there's nothing that's not defined. Yeah, and to the pure, all things are pure. Yeah. That was good. All right, I guess we'll sign off the internet here. Okay. How are you doing? Okay. Arnie is watching. Hello, Arnie. Oh, no, no, you want to drive. <laughs> Texas, Montana, Africa. I get ready to walk out the door. We need this message, and it's awesome. I have hooks right in my kitchen. I have hooks, yeah. And so be like, oh, my God, I'm going to be late for work. I cannot find my keys. Yeah, I have a hand in my hook right there. I tell my husband, when you